This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles. Unlimited access at just $2.99 a month, and for 30 days, it's free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash geographics. Use the code geographics. More on them in a bit. The colony of Jamestown was founded by a contingent of 104 English settlers on May the 13th, 1607, a full 13 years before the landing of the Mayflower. To give you some context, rooted in pop culture, this is where Disney's Pocahontas takes place. On the other hand, I expect many of our American friends will acknowledge Jamestown as the birthplace of America. In an age of competitive exploration that often pitted the Spanish and English empires against one another, Jamestown was the first successful British colony in North America. Note the word successful. The English crown had founded other colonies in the preceding years, but they had all failed. The best-known example is Roanoke, established by Sir Walter Raleigh. Its entire population, though, mysteriously disappeared around August of 1590. Jamestown came very close to complete failure and extinction. Its inhabitants experienced war, famine, disease, and some very dark episodes that Disney's scriptwriters forgot to tell us about when we were kids. And yet, despite all the hardships, the settlers at Jamestown eventually made it through several winters of discontent. But let's get into it, shall we? Because I'm going to take you on a quick tour of modern Jamestown before we dive into its history. And a word of warning, some of today's story might not be suitable for our younger viewers. <laughs> The area around the Jamestown settlement is known as Historic Jamestown, a tourist site and conservation area about 60 miles or 100 kilometers west of Virginia's capital, Richmond. I must confess that I've never been there, but we did do our homework, so I could easily impersonate a tour guide. Admission brings in $20 for adults, but it's free for children if you're under 15. Tourists who purchase entrance are awarded access to the area for seven consecutive days. The two main settlements open to visitors are James Fort and Newtown. James Fort, as the name suggests, was the first fortified stronghold built by the colonists. It was constructed shortly after the settlers' landing in May of 1607, following the first attack of the natives of the Powhatan Confederacy. The fort was originally triangular in shape, with its longest side facing the James River and three towers at the vertices. The English settlers had a small artillery contingent of four or five cannons placed upon these bulwarks. By 1609, the fort had been expanded to a pentagon shape and it could boast 24 cannons. The triangular and pentagon shapes were a common tactic at the time as they allowed the artillery on the towers to release converging fire in case of an attack. In the following decades, the fort fell into disrepair and was eventually leveled when the whole of Jamestown Island became a tobacco plantation. Three centuries later, in 1994, the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities began an extensive archaeological exploration. The archaeologists were able to unearth more than two million artifacts that shed light on the daily lives of the soldiers, artisans, gentlemen, commoners, and families who lived within the fort. As we'll learn later, they were able to find evidence of the darkest events that took place within the palisades of the fort. Just outside those walls, the settlers had founded Newtown, later known as James City. As the city expanded in the 1620s, it effectively became the capital of the English colonial territory of Virginia, hosting its government. James City was ravaged by both fire and pestilence several times, including in 1699, which ultimately prompted the seat of government to move inland to Middle Plantation, which was soon renamed Williamsburg. Archaeologists were able to locate the foundations of the house of one Captain Pierce of Newtown, a house now known as the Angela Site. Angela was an African woman who had landed in Jamestown in 1619, having traveled from modern-day Angola completely against her will. She had been abducted by slave traders, and while being transported across the Atlantic, the ship was attacked by two English privateers. The raiders took Angela and 20 to 30 other Africans to Jamestown. They became the first recorded Africans to land in North America. Upon her arrival, Angela became an indentured servant in the household of Captain Pierce. An indentured servant typically worked four to seven years in exchange for passage, room, board, lodging, and eventually a freedom package consisting of 25 acres of land, a cow, food, and other supplies. 
While they were occasionally subjected to harsh treatment, indentured servants were not slaves and were protected by specific laws. However, this limited freedom it didn't last long. In 1661, Virginia passed its first laws explicitly legalizing slavery. By and large, Angela's descendants would not find freedom on the western side of the Atlantic for another 200 years. The expedition that led to the foundation of Jamestown was funded by a private enterprise, the Virginia Company, chartered in 1606 by King James I. Its missions were to make a profit in the Americas, of course, but also to limit the expansion of the Spanish, to seek northwest passage to the Orient, and to convert Virginia natives to the Anglican religion. The company launched three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery in December of 1606. They set off with 105 passengers, one of whom died during the voyage. The other 104 reached the Virginia coast in late April 1607 under the leadership of Captain Christopher Newport. The ship sailed up the James River and on May 13 settled on a small island selected for its deep water anchorage and good defensive position. This was to become Jamestown, and it was due to suffer right from the start. The area was surrounded by a confederation of Algonquian natives numbering between 14 to 15,000. They were led by the powerful Powhatan people. Relations with the Powhatan Confederation would prove tenuous, with alternating periods of successful trade, fragile peace, and open conflict. In addition to that, the area lacked a steady supply of fresh water. The area was not suited for agriculture, and to be honest, neither were the men. Many of the original colonists were upper-class Englishmen, and they lacked laborers and skilled farmers. And when I say English men, I mean it. These guys were, well, 100% guys. The first two women only arrived two years later, and as the years flew by, women continued to be a notably small minority compared to men. In fact, some colonists resorted to sexually assaulting the native women, which may have been one of the causes for recurring wars with the Powhatan's Confederation. In September of 1608, the colony's leadership was picked up by Captain John Smith. Yep. That John Smith. According to legend, Captain Smith was captured by Algonquian warriors and saved from execution by Powhatan's favorite daughter, Pocahontas. Disney Studios, as well as much more serious filmmaker Terence Malick and his historical epic The New World, have told us the story of their romantic relationship that defied prejudice and brought together two civilizations. But, well, just no. Pocahontas, whose real name was Amanute, was 10 or 11 at the time, so again, just no. And the supposed execution? Either it didn't happen at all, or if it did, it was an elaborate ceremony to induct Smith into Powhatan's tribe. John Smith later claimed that he and Amanute had become friends, and this friendship helped ease relations between the colonists and the natives. While it is true that Smith had established good trading relationships with Powhatan, it is unlikely that the young princess had played a role at this stage. Later in her teenage years, Amanute slash Pocahontas did have a closer relationship with the English settlers, marrying tobacco farmer John Rolfe and traveling to England to act as an ambassador on behalf of the Algonquian nation. Sadly, she died of consumption in England at the age of just 21. I won't go into all of the details of the short and tragic life of Pocahontas. What I can tell you is that she was kidnapped by the colonists to leverage a peace treaty from her father, meaning she was likely raped in captivity before being forced to convert to Christianity and marry Rolf. Her eventual death was suspicious, and she may have been poisoned by her own husband. If you want to know more about that, please make sure you watch our biographics video all about Pocahontas. So, returning to Captain John Smith. In the fall of 1609, he was injured in a gunpowder accident and returned to England. His departure was followed by the Starving Time, a period of warfare between the colonists and Powhatan's confederation, made worse by rampant disease and starvation. This is when the Jamestown story took a decidedly horrible twist. but. Be patient for now, I'll dive deep into the starving time later on. By the spring of 1610, the original 104 colonists had been joined by a further 300 newcomers, only for nearly 90% of the total population to die. Such was the cruelty of the starving time. The remaining 60 or so decided to abandon the colony when new settlers with supplies arrived from England, eager to find wealth in Virginia. This group was led by the new governor, who came with a mandate for stronger leadership and harsh punishments for the dissidents and non-productive. Slowly, Jamestown got back on its feet, helped in 1612 by Rolfe's idea to grow tobacco as a cash crop for the Virginia Company. A few years later, in 1619, Angela and the other Africans landed in Virginia, beginning a long period of servitude and slavery for Africans on American soil. 
This is also the year in which the first representative government in British America was instituted in Jamestown. This was the General Assembly, convened on July the 30th by a newly appointed governor, Lord Yardley. He had listened to the requests of settlers who wanted input in the laws governing them. The other big event for the year was the arrival of 90 women in Jamestown, recruited and shipped by the Virginia Company, with the primary focus of starting families and increasing the population of Jamestown. Twelve years after its foundation, the settlement was thriving so much so that colonists were claiming more and more lands from the Algonquians. The fragile peace, which had been facilitated by the union of Pocahontas and Rolf, eventually dissolved in March of 1622. The new leader of the natives, Opanchankano, attacked the colony, killing between 350 and 400 of the then 1,200 settlers. The chief was expecting the English to leave, but instead they regrouped to resist further attacks. The conflict dragged on for 10 years, and another peace was agreed in 1632. But the English-Algonquian relationship had entered a repeating pattern. Colonists would take advantage of periods of peace to repopulate their lands, expand their farms, and grab more land off the natives. Eventually, the Algonquians would retaliate, starting another war. The next conflict erupted in April 1644, when Open Chankanao again attacked Jamestown, killing 400 of the now 8,000 inhabitants. This war finally ended in 1646, when he was captured and shot in the back by a guard. His death brought an end to what was the Powhatan Confederation, which was reduced to the status of tributary of the English crown. Thirty years later, conflicts with the natives resumed. While the majority of the local tribes were allied with the English, some continued attacking the outlying tobacco plantations. One of the tobacco farmers, one Nathaniel Bacon, rallied a militia of a thousand settlers to take care of the Indian problem. In their rabid fury, Bacon's men did not differentiate between hostile and allied natives attacking both. The then-governor Berkeley tried to restrain the militia and declared Bacon to be a rebel. As a result, Jamestown became embroiled in a small civil war in September of 1676. Bacon attacked the city and had his followers set it on fire, destroying 16 to 18 houses, the church, and the state house. Thankfully, this rebellion was short-lived. In October, Nathaniel Bacon died of dysentery and his small army dispersed. Many of the rebels were captured and 23 were handed over to Governor Berkeley. As a result of Bacon's rebellion, another treaty was signed between the English and the Virginia Indians. More tribes were part of this treaty than the one of 1646. The treaty set up more reservation lands and reinforced a yearly tribute payment of fish and game that the tribes had to make to the English. In 1698, Jamestown faced its final tribulation as capital of the colony when fire struck yet again. This time, it was started by a prisoner awaiting execution. The fire was less extensive than the one caused by Bacon, though it did destroy the prison and the state house. Colonists continued to live on Jamestown Island and reap the farmlands after the capital was moved west to Williamsburg, but by 1700, almost nothing was left of the original colony. Now, just before we get on to that next step, I want to take a quick moment to tell you about today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Now, if you're looking for a specific recommendation from me on that platform, well, what ties in quite well with today's video is a series called Deep Time History, and specifically, the second episode on that series, all about the age of exploration, something you're probably going to be into if you're enjoying this video. Now, full disclosure, I haven't actually seen this one yet, but A, if it's anything like anything else on Curiosity Stream, it's going to be great. And two, I had a quick skip through it, a quick watch, and it does look really good. Curiosity Stream is available on loads of platforms, web app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, Apple TV. All of that is also available worldwide. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash geographics. Use the promo code geographics during the sign up process. That's a great way to support the show, keep us making more videos, and I really couldn't think of a better sponsor for a channel like this. So please do check them out below, and let's get back to today's video. It's now time to look in detail at what became known as the Starving Time of Jamestown from the summer of 1609 to the winter of 1610. While the colony was still struggling to establish itself, just three to four years after the Virginia Company landed in the New World, the settlers were suffering from food shortages, diseases, and fractured leadership. A famine caused by a prolonged drought led to competition over resources with the natives. This tension escalated into a conflict and protracted siege of James Fort. Chief Powhatan ordered his warriors to attack any colonists or plunder any livestock found outside the fort. 
In 1609, Jamestown was expecting a fleet of nine ships with new colonists and enough supplies to last through the winter, courtesy of the Virginia Trading Company. Unfortunately, a hurricane had damaged the fleet, causing the largest vessel, the Sea Venture, to shipwreck on Bermuda. The remainder of the expedition managed to reach Jamestown by mid-August. This may have looked like good news for the colonists, but the arrivals were only able to bring a fraction of the initial cargo with them. Plus, there were 300 new colonists, which meant even more mouths to feed. Among the new 300 settlers, there was a teenage girl called Jane. Keep that in mind. In October of 1609, Captain John Smith was forced to return to England after being badly injured in that gunpowder explosion, which may or may not have been accidental. The man was not exactly beloved by the people of Jamestown, as he imposed a very strict regime of food rationing. In his absence, leadership was handed over to one George Percy, who would later publish A True Relation on the Events of the Starving Time. In his writings, Percy gives us a clear idea of how desperate the situation was. Indians killed as fast without the fort as famine and pestilence did within. He also wrote that to satisfy their cruel hunger, some settlers went into the woods looking for snakes, roots, anything they could sink their teeth into. But these expeditions usually ended with the foragers being cut down by Powhatan's warriors. The only other option was to eat what was left inside the fort. First, the colonists ate the leather from their own boots. Then they butchered all of their seven horses. Next, it was the dogs, cats, mice, and other vermin. Finally, they started eating each other. According to Percy, some settlers exhumed and ate dead corpses of their compatriots as well as some of the natives, while others licked up the blood which had fallen from their weak fellows. Tales of cannibalism within the fort had reached Europe in the spring of 1610 thanks to a small crew of settlers who had escaped Jamestown on a small ship called the Swallow. In all their accounts, colonists would cannibalize exclusively the corpses of those who had already starved, died of disease, or were killed in combat. With one exception. The deserters told of a story of a man who had killed his pregnant wife with the explicit intent to devour her. That story was later retold by Sir Thomas Gate, a later governor of the colony, with an added detail. The man had taken great care to butcher, skin, and powder his wife's body with salt in order to better preserve it. The culinary details kept on piling up in future versions of this gut-churning tale. Captain John Smith, in his work General History of Virginia, New England and the Summer Isles, displayed a knack for black humor worthy of Monty Python. Now whether she was better roasted, boiled, or carbonadoed, I know not, but of such a dish as powdered wife, I never heard of. By the way, by carbonadoed, he meant barbecued. But was all this true? Had a man really killed his wife and his unborn child in order to feed himself and remain alive? According to a later report of the Virginia Company, the murderer had acted out of hatred for his wife, not out of desperate hunger. Only at the trial he had stated that his wife had died of natural causes, and he had hidden the body with the intent of eating her at a later stage. And by trial we mean he was suspended by his thumbs for minutes on end, tortured, beaten, and then burned alive. At this stage, you might be thinking that the claims of cannibalism may have been exaggerated or even false. For centuries, this was the opinion of many historians who believed the stories of cannibalism were only slanderous rumors spread to damage the prestige of the Virginia colony. Back then, in 2012, archaeologists at the historic Jamestown site made an invaluable forensic discovery. Portions of the butchered skull and shinbone of a 14-year-old girl from England, Jane, one of the 300 that had arrived in August of 1609. The remains were analyzed by Doug Owsley, head of physical anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Owsley found multiple chop and cut marks on the girl's skull made by one or more assailants. According to him, they were clearly interested in cheek meat, muscles of the face, tongue, and brain. The researcher determines that the cutting was not done by an experienced butcher, as the marks on the bones show signs of hesitancy and repeated failed attempts. Thankfully, the girl today, known as Jane, was subjected to this treatment only after she had died of natural causes. Jane's legacy helped solve a centuries-long mystery. It also made it easy to imagine the torture those colonists must have gone through during the starving time. By the spring of 1610, of the initial 104 settlers plus the 300 latecomers, only 60 were still alive. Jamestown may have become another failed settlement, a lost colony like Roanoke. Had it been destroyed or abandoned completely, North America may look very different today. But Jamestown, it didn't fade away. The colony was saved that spring of 1610 by the arrival of more settlers, the survivors of the shipwreck of the Sea Venture, straight from Bermuda. These resourceful sailors had built themselves a new boat and landed with much-needed supplies. And with that, the starving time was finally over.
The Jamestown settlement survived for almost a century, and Virginia became one of the primary springboards for further exploration and colonization of North America. But why were its first few years such a catastrophe? Was it due to poor leadership, the general incompetence of the settlers, or hostilities with the Algonquians? You could say all of the above, sure, but we'd like to focus on three specific elements which may spell triumph or disaster for any attempt at colonialism. And these are location, location, location. What was wrong with the location chosen by the first wave of settlers? They'd picked the best spot, at least according to the instructions from the Virginia Company. Thou shalt pick a spot which is not 90, not 110, not 120, but a hundred millionth from the river's mouth. Whence thou shalt rest in safety from the foul and scoundrelous attacks of the Spanish ships, and the Spanish soldiereths, and the Spanish muskets, and the Spanish grape shot, and thou gettest the point. Other instructions included to stay close to a deep water anchorage, to facilitate provision of supplies, and to take great care not to offend the naturals, which is how they referred to natives. So according to these instructions, Jamestown's location was spot on. To not offend the naturals, the settlers lay their tents on a piece of unclaimed land. But if that land was unclaimed, there was a reason why. It was marshy, infested with mosquitoes, and without reliable clean water. That meant that arable land was scarce, leading to food shortages. Impure water and clouds of mosquitoes caused outbreaks of typhoid, dysentery, and malaria. The initial settlement was tolerated by the Powhatan Confederacy, but as soon as the colonists sought to grab more fertile lands upriver, they faced strong resistance by the natives. After the marriage of Pocahontas and John Rolfe, the English and Powhatan Confederacy reached a fragile peace. It was only then that the colonists were allowed to farm more suitable lands and generate profits from their tobacco cash crops. Eventually, the rise of an agrarian tobacco economy provided the basics for prosperity and expansion, and a small group of settlers became quite wealthy. The fact that most of this happened outside of Jamestown, however, only reaffirms the poor quality of the location for launching a colony. The reality of military and colonial enterprises is almost always complex. However, the elements that drive their success or failure sometimes boil down to something really simple. Jamestown needed reliable access to resources, food, clean water, and trade routes, and it could never quite lock down all three. So I hope you enjoyed this brief encounter with the story of Jamestown, an origin story or foundational myth for the United States, if you like. The small community contained, in a nutshell, the elements that would shape much of American history post-independence, the wars against the native nations and their eventual displacement, the institution of slavery, even a civil war, but also a spirit of innovation and resilience against all odds, one that would fuel the unstoppable march towards the West to fulfill its manifest destiny. If you want to hear another story about another settlement in the Americas that failed completely for similar reasons, do check out our video about the Darien Venture, the colony that bankrupted Scotland. And if you've been to historic Jamestown, let us know how it was in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching this video. Please do like it if you liked it, subscribe if you want more videos from us, and I'll see you next time.